Jewish. How do you find that out? You know, Tom, it's just, it's just <laughs> Leonard Saltzman. Here. Potter. Here. Please read the first item. Item 1647, Oregon Institute of Technology, Sustainability, and Mayor Klamath Falls Sustainable Energy Solutions. Well, a few months back, I had the privilege of going down to Southern Oregon to um, visit some of the cities and counties in Southern Oregon, and um, I really enjoyed my time in Klamath Falls. And... Um, Mayor Todd Kelstrom and uh, President Maple were very gracious host and uh, showed us around and we learned a lot about uh, Klamath Falls and the Oregon Institute of Technology. And uh, I was really impressed with uh, how they use their geothermal resources as well as what they're doing at the, the Institute uh, to promote uh, the work that, that they're doing there. So I'd like to invite up uh, Dr. Chris Maples, the president of Oregon Institute of Technology, and Valerie Lane, uh, the chief of staff at uh, Oregon Institute of Technology. And just so a little bit of a background about uh, President Maples. He was appointed the sixth OIT president and began his duties on October the 1st. So he's kind of a newbie and I want to welcome you to Portland and Oregon, I guess. Thank so. You. President Maples received his bachelor's degree in geology from West Georgia College and his MS and PhD degrees from Indiana University in geology with a minor in biology. He most recently served as executive vice president for research at the Desert Research Institute in Nevada. Um, and Klamath Falls, uh, Mayor Kelstrom was, uh, Todd Kelstrom was going to come up here but has been unable to. I understand we have a short video from uh, Mayor Kelstrom. But I really appreciate you folks coming up. I know it's it's a long uh, flight, or actually a short flight up here. And uh, but and tell us a little bit about uh, the school. I was kind of surprised to see how uh, how you're spread around the state, and particularly in the Portland area. So welcome to, to City Council, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor, uh, Commissioners. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And. Uh, it, I'll be honest, it was a surprise to me coming to uh, Oregon and OIT to find out how many places we were around the state. Uh, we have four campuses here in the Portland area uh, alone, uh, one near Clackamas Community College, one uh, out, on the, uh, out on the west side uh, at um, Amber, Amber, Amber Glen um, Road, uh, one on the OHSU campus on the hill. Uh, we have a, a a building there that we lease from the OHSU for our clinical lab sciences, and uh, one out in uh, Tualatin near Wilsonville where we do paramedic work. We have a campus uh, that we do dental hygiene in LeGrand. Uh, <clears throat> we even have a campus in Seattle at uh, Boeing where we work with uh, Boeing uh, engineers uh, directly. So it's, it's, really, uh, it's really a nice place, a nice school. Um, Interesting students, uh, terrific faculty, and uh, the first renewable energy engineering degree in the country. Uh, we've gotten quite a bit of press about that, including some of the New York Times within the past year or so. Um, it's helped lead uh, OIT to uh, a level of recognition uh, that, that I think is, uh, is quite good for the state of Oregon across the board. We are uh, one of the top 10 institutions, baccalaureate uh, degree institutions in the U.S. according to the, in, in the Western U.S., according to the U.S. News and World Report. And bear in mind that Western U.S. goes from Texas to California and includes those states. So it's a huge number of schools. Um, we are, uh, we are highly regarded in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different ways. Uh, it's just a terrific place and I'm thoroughly enjoying Oregon. 
it's a, uh, I probably shouldn't say this on the record, but uh, I feel like I traded up from Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> you did. <laughs> How many students do you have enrolled? Uh, a smidge mm -hmm. over 3,500 mm -hmm. collectively. Mm -hmm. uh, there are about 2,500 on the uh, main campus in uh, Klamath Falls and then another 1,000 at, uh, at the other campuses that we have scattered around. And it's primarily a polytechnic institution focusing engineering and health, uh, allied health science areas. Um, our students uh, graduate and approximately 98% of them get jobs within the first month or two. Um, after they leave. Uh, the average um, wage of those jobs is over $50,000 a year at this point. Um, we have what I consider to be a fairly recession-proof student population uh, when they get done. A number of our students who don't graduate don't graduate because they go ahead and get job offers that they can't refuse and they just take off and do them and then come back and finish their degrees later. What's your mix of public and private dollars that support your work? Um, we are primarily, as a, as a state institution, one of the uh, institutions in the Oregon University system, we get about 50% of our support from uh, the state uh, in terms of state dollars coming into the campus. Um, and the rest of it is tuition and uh, um, foundation support. We have uh, a lot of scholarships that we provide to students. We have probably 90 different scholarships that we provide to, sco to students at, at different levels. Tell us about uh, your unique opportunity laying beneath the ground. We, uh, and that's what, uh, that's what today is about. And uh, we really enjoyed your visit down in Klamath Falls, by the way. Um, we sit in an area where there is uh, quite a geothermal resource. And uh, what the city has done is has tapped into that geothermal resource to do things like heating sidewalks, providing additional power here and there. Uh, we do a lot of heating of the uh, Klamath Falls campus with geothermal. Um, at, and what we have planned for the future is to drill deeper, uh, get a hotter water source, and actually build a power plant on our campus that will allow us to go completely off the grid. Um, and that, that's our goal, is to be off the grid in a few years and even selling some power back uh, by, by doing a, a geothermal uh, exploitation here. And it, it was a great visit that we had, by the way. We thoroughly was. enjoyed showing you some parts of that, including, uh, including our, <clears throat> our, our local microbrewery that uses geothermal. Uh, for a lot of their process. You showed and, the and, mayor the microbrewery? We did. It, it, was, it, was, it wasn't really open at the time. <laughs> <laughs> the mayor was there strictly in an official capacity. Official. That's right. And uh, once we all they cooled were there the geothermal down, it was quite tasty <laughs> <laughs> when you mixed hops with it. <laughs> well, tell us more about the school. I, I was just so impressed. It's a beautiful campus. Thank you. Uh, spread out over several hills there and um, has it, a very good relationship with the city and it is it started in 1947 actually uh, to, um, to to work with returning veterans from World War II um, and it started with a whole variety of more technology uh, votech almost type of uh, offerings at the time um, there has been a 60 plus year progression toward uh, more of an educational set of opportunities, a lot more in the uh, engineering, uh, especially engineering where you can get some sort of a professional engineering license at some point at the end. And now recently in, in recent years, uh, primarily led by the vision of former President Martha Ann Dow, uh, health sciences and health related activities, particularly uh, technical health. The health field is changing so rapidly with so much instrumentation. Uh, that there is a, a, a real need for people who can do all kinds of imaging work, imaging technologies, uh, nursing, all kinds of, of health-related activities, dental hygiene. Um, so we're, we're really trying to serve the need of the state and the region uh, in, in requiring these types of jobs uh, and filling these types of jobs uh, across the board. With your engineering program, how do, how do you fit together with the existing program, say, at OSU and the, the new program that's been developed at Portland State? That's an excellent question. What, what we're doing is working together uh, in many respects, and uh, 
bear in mind that what OIT is is primarily at this point an undergraduate institution. Our method of delivery is one in which we have fairly small classes, very hands-on. Uh, it's a very applied, hands-on type of learning institution where our students do a large number of internships and externships. So the type of learning in that engineering is a little different than you would get at, uh, at the larger institutions in the state. That said, a number of our students will go into a graduate program uh, when they are done. And most often they will go, I think, uh, in, in the state of Oregon. It, it works out well for them to do that. Is there a, uh, what kind of pipeline do you have uh, with the Silicon Forest here and our high-tech employers? Do uh, your students fare well in those kinds of opportunities? They do, and uh, we just had a uh, alumni luncheon, in fact, with a number of our intel uh, in employees and alumni. Uh, and so, yes, they've fared well in there. Um, and uh, we work up and down the up and down the West Coast in many areas. We have uh, well over a hundred alumni, for instance. And I didn't realize this when I was living in Reno, Nevada. We have well over a hundred alumni working at a place called International Gaming Technology in Reno. Um, and so you know, we have a, we have several hundred alumni working at Boeing. Uh, we have probably a couple hundred or so working at Intel. Um, we do well up and down and provide a, a high-tech workforce uh, that will help these type of companies come into the area and expand and develop. Uh, the workforce is one of the things that, that holds a lot of companies back. Uh, and uh, that's one of the things that I feel like Oregon does a pretty good job at is providing that workforce because of the overall state support for higher ed, uh, which is critical. Well, I, I was curious. You, you talked about your new um, renewable in, renewable energy engineering degree, and I guess I'm I'm just a little I'm kind of curious what what's in that curriculum that maybe isn't in mechanical He's engineering. An engineer, ah, civil sure. engineering. Yeah. So yeah, what is it makes it a renewable energy? There, there's engineer? a lot of mechanical and electrical um, basic concepts that ultimately th then apply to renewable energy engineering, uh, and a fair amount of what we're doing in the renewable energy engineering is building on our strengths in the mechanical and electrical engineering, but doing so in ways in which you're solving problems that are specifically uh, applied to renewable energy systems as a collective whole, uh, so that we are producing people who are able to go into these system type of engineering settings and go to work for solar companies or wind companies or, or even companies that are that are looking to make smaller plants that would go uh, offline in small settings and would rotate back and forth between different types of renewable uh, opportunities. So that it would be wind one day, solar the next day, maybe a little bit of biofuel or biomass uh, an another day. Um, and much of this also then feeds into the battery technology itself as well because the batteries are a real key in a lot of the renewable energy systems. I'm just curious, if, if you were in Salem today, you'd be asking for more public support for your programs. Uh, what, what uh, <laughs> Since you're before the Portland City Council and you have some operations here within Portland, what can the city of Portland do to contribute to your success? Um, that, that, that's also a really good question. Um, and and if, I were, if I were in Salem, you're right. I would be asking on behalf of, of a lot of the institutions here for support because I truly view this as an investment in Oregon's future um, and I will scale it to this is an investment in Portland's future as well. Uh, what we are doing is producing students who will go to work in really good high-tech areas here who will help solve some of the problems here who will know whether or not it is feasible to drill underneath the hill where OHSU is and bring on some of the geothermal uh, that might be there. Uh, some people who are going to solve some of the problems as population pressure continues and as we move forward in, in a global society. Um, this is, in many respects, I, I view it as investment with a direct payback down the line and, and ways that, the, that Portland can help. I, you know, I would flip that around to a certain extent and, and ask how it is that, that we, as, as one of the campuses here in, in the city, and there are a number, um, you know, how can we help you? Um, how can we help you promote an overall Portland agenda um, as, as, as a renewable city, a green city, a good place for people to live? 
uh, something sustainable down the line. Um, so we would like to be a part of that, and we would be delighted to help. So I met with um, some of your folks in the room. Um, we're putting together the Sustainability Institute here, and uh, intended to be a partnership with the private sector, the nonprofit, government, academia, and so we've had you and some of your folks in those initial discussions, and really appreciate it. Absolutely, and they were appreciative of being there. We uh, we are grateful to be part of that group and uh, the way you described it in terms of public-private partnerships, that is truly the path forward here. I, I don't think any one sector is going to be able to do this entirely alone. Have your, have your graduates fared well uh, to the extent and any have had an interest in working for the city or any of its bureaus? I'm sure they have an interest. I don't know how much of an opportunity they have had at this point. I just That I just don't know. Um, they may have had lots of opportunity and they may have gone to work for the city and I would have to do the, do my homework on that to track it down. I believe our last count we had 10 employed by the city of Portland. So 10 at last count employed by the city. Valerie, is there anything you'd like to add to this? We just truly appreciate this opportunity. Um, Oregon Institute of Technology is part of the overall Oregon University system. And to be part of the um, change and progress for our state is phenomenal. And we realized that um, when we started operations at, <clears throat> in the Portland area in 1983, that this is an area that we will always have an opportunity to grow and emerge and evolve into um, an ever-changing progressive institution for the state and for our metropolitan um, folks. So we appreciate this opportunity. Good. Well, you know, Mayor uh, Kelstrom is one of the folks that come up every, uh, or the last two Rose Festival Grand Floral Parades to walk to the mayor's marching unit. And so I've really enjoyed getting to know him then and then in our visit to, to Klamath Falls. I understand you have a, a brief uh, greeting from the mayor? We do. Good afternoon. I'm Todd Kelstrom. I'm the mayor of the city of Klamath Falls, and it's my pleasure to uh, be here uh, for you today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. And Tom, I really appreciate the invitation and appreciate your visit down. Uh, you and Carl came down and had a wonderful time here, I hope, uh, and saw what we were doing here as far as sustainability uh, in Klamath Falls. Klamath Falls is the county seat for Klamath County. The area is commonly known as the Klamath Basin, which includes an area that extends into Northern California. It's a rugged land that has caused its residents to value self-reliance, hard work, and perseverance. Sustainability has never been perceived as a luxury, but a historic necessity. The citizens of Klamath Falls know that sustainable living is not a fad, but a means toward a better way of life. We're experiencing environmental degradation that is going to be compounding in our lifetimes. Um, this is not something that's going to go away. It's not something that we can ignore anymore. Um, our, all of our indices, climate change, water quality, clean water availability, air pollution, pollution in our, our bodies, creating medical, medical problems, these are things that have compounded over the last 100 years. And there's finally a recognition that we need to do some serious work on mitigating these problems. Sustainability began with the original Native American settlers in the region. They made clothing from tuleeds, baskets from pine needles, and revered the locations of numerous hot springs as sacred places. As homesteaders moved into the area, hot artisans were used to scald livestock during the butchering process and for health and recreation purposes. Klamath's close proximity to the Cascade Mountains provides ample geothermal resources, which are now used to heat homes, sidewalks, and commercial greenhouses. If there's anything that folks typically know about Klamath Falls, 
uh, it might be the geothermal resource that's down here. It's something that the community has taken advantage of for years. We've got downtown heating district. We've got neighborhoods that take advantage of uh, those shallow geothermal wells for, uh, for residential heating. Uh, this whole campus, in fact, is heated by geothermal wells. And uh, the Oregon Institute of Technology over the past couple of years has applied for a few block grants <coughs> through our Blue Sky Block Grant Program. This is our renewable energy product. It's the most popular renewable energy product in the country right now. And uh, <coughs> in addition to uh, making renewable energy available to our customers, uh, it also uh, creates a grant pool and dollars available to fund renewable energy projects throughout our service territory. So. Uh, the Oregon Institute of Technology actually has a project going over in Lakeview, Oregon, which is about two hours away, and uh, they're doing a renewable energy demonstration project, and we were <coughs> able to uh, give them $25,000 to help make that project happen, and it's just about complete. Um, Ron Wyden was down recently, our senator, and he was able to announce the $100,000 Blue Sky Block Grant that we were able to provide OIT this year, and that's going to help OIT develop a low temperature geothermal energy project. So that was uh, uh, pretty neat. Oregon Institute of Technology will embark on two electric generation projects in the near future. The first will utilize existing resources already used to heat the campus. Its 195 degree water will power a plant to provide 20% of the power needed at OIT. The 280 kilowatt plant will also serve as a demonstration for those interested in power generation and be a hands-on laboratory for OIT students. The second project begins with drilling a deep well of up to 6,000 feet. Geochemical analysis indicates the water of 300 degrees can be found at this depth. This temperature will power a 1.5 megawatt plant that will take OIT completely off the grid. We will be the first campus in the world to get all of their energy from directly on campus from geothermal energy. And we'll be the first power plant in the state of Oregon as well. OIT's Geo Heat Center is one element of the Oregon Renewable Energy Center, which is sited at OIT. The Geo Heat Center is an international clearinghouse for information on the resource. OIT has been a sustainable campus since 1974. Um, we've had the Geo Heat Center since then, and the Geo Heat Center has worked with um, the city of Klamath Falls on numerous projects, especially downtown, um, with providing geothermal consulting on heating projects, electric pro projects, and also things like heating sidewalks. Um, great, great partnership with the city of Klamath Falls. OIT, in terms of being a green campus, is far and above uh, a leadership in sustainability in the state and in the nation. Geothermal may be the cornerstone of sustainable climate, but it is not the only green activity in the region or on the OIT campus. The area boasts 300 sunny days each year, which provides ample resource for solar technologies. The city of Clam Falls recently completed a feasibility study for the use of solar panels to power the waste treatment plant. There is also the potential to create a solar farm to energize all city government buildings. The water treatment plant also factors into two other sustainable initiatives. Dried sludge is mixed with chipped vegetation to create mulch that is highly sought after by gardeners. Mayor Kellstrom says people have to make appointments to get the fertile mix. Methane, a byproduct of the plant, is being considered as a biofuel for city-owned vehicles and has potential for producing electricity. Biodiesel is an endeavor that brought <coughs> local agriculturists and <coughs> academics together. Through the Oregon Renewable Energy Center, students from a variety of disciplines work on real-world projects, such as an electric hybrid car and a small biodiesel production plant that utilizes campus waste cooking oil. One passionate student began attending community meetings about sustainable practices and overheard a conversation about difficulties a local resident had with a seed oil press. As a result of this um, cross-discipline project, uh, we had a student out in the community overheard these community members talking about an issue they have in one of their sustainable practices, and he brought that back to the university. and. Then he and I worked on putting together a grant, 
proposal and brought in another professor from the electrical engineering uh, group. And that got funded through BEST. And so now we have this project where we're trying to control the moisture of the seed, oil seed, as it goes through the presses so that the presses will have the highest level of efficiency as far as um, getting, extracting oil from the seed. And, and the end result is more oil and a better uh, byproduct from the presses that can then later be fed to cattle. Raising oil seed is not the only agricultural involvement with sustainability. Throughout the Klamath Basin, farmers, ranchers, and, and dairy owners are moving to organic products. Big John's Garden sells garlic online throughout the United States. The products are also available in retail outlets within the Willamette Valley. Rogue Creamery's cheese is produced from organic milk, which comes from select Klamath Holstein herds. At Liskey Farms, geothermal hothouses produce insect devouring mighty mites, tilapia, organic tomatoes, and much more. Soon the farm will embark on its own power plant endeavor. A stone's throw from City Hall, tree seedlings begin their life cycle in geothermal hothouses, while at the other end of town, geothermal water is used to produce beer. In sustainable Klamath, citizens are born in a geothermally heated hospital, educated at a university that was the first in the nation to offer a renewable energy degree, and live to implement systems that will make life better for themselves and the generations yet to come. Uh, I'm very proud of what we have accomplished uh, in the city. Uh, some of these things don't pertain necessarily to Portland, but uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be before you today. And again, Tom, thanks for uh, inviting us up, and I hope we can see you uh, soon uh, sometime. Thanks very much. Very impressive. Thank you. Yes, it's... Um, one other, uh, one other uh, tie-up of this, uh, the Renewable Energy Engineering degree, uh, the, num the majority of the students in that degree are here in Portland. Hmm. Uh, we have about 130 or thereabouts students, 80 of whom are up here in Portland. Boy, that's great. That's where this one has grown the most. It's a potential pool of uh, candidates for us, too. Huh? Absolutely. Yes. But Valerie, did you want to add anything? We do have some gifts that we would like to present to you. Okay. And uh, I hope that you all know that Mayor Kelstrom truly wanted to be here today, but given the proximity to the holiday, it was difficult to fit into his schedule. Uh, OIT is doing some really phenomenal work statewide. And as I was telling Stephanie earlier, I believe that all of us within the Oregon University system understand that it will take a consortium of education for our citizens of tomorrow to uh, really take us to the place we need to be. And we thank you. Well, Mr. President, I just want to note that you came to Oregon because of a job with Oregon Higher Education. You bet. And my wife and I came here because she was offered a job with Oregon Higher Education. So we have that in common. And, and if you could uh, lend us some of those 300 days of sunshine, we would. Uh, <laughs> you don't need it today. It's a it's a Chamber of Commerce day out there today. Geothermal has something to do with that, too. I don't know. But. Sounds nice. <laughs> Dr. Maples, thank you for being here. Thank you, yeah. Valerie. And uh, I look forward to having dinner with you folks tonight. Very much so. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. And please tell Todd hello for us. Well, that's a good way to give us gifts. Is to just give one to the attorney. Thank you. Look forward to working with you. It's good to see you, Chris. Please read the uh, 230 time, sir. Item 1648, adopt crime prevention through environmental design policy strategy for city-funded multifamily residential development and non-binding recommendations for private sector developers of multifamily residential development. I'm very excited about this presentation today because it's something that uh, I've been thinking about for a long time as a uh, Young police lieutenant, uh, three decades ago, I had the opportunity to go through uh, some SEPTED training in Portland. 
And uh, I spent the rest of my career trying to get the city interested in some SEPTED ordinances because I was so impressed with what the Fire Bureau did with their fire um, safety codes. And I thought, you know, the same thing should apply to personal safety as well for, for um, to, to help prevent crime and to provide a safer environment for our, our community. And uh, these folks are here today to talk about that. I think that uh, it's, it's going to be uh, an exciting presentation. It's going to be a good presentation. And I hope that uh, at the end of this, end of this that, uh, that the council adopts this because it's, it's a good start on the road to making our community a better place for everybody. So who starts? Uh, well, we should identify ourselves for the record. My name is Jeremy Van Curen. I'm with Mayor Potter's office. Rosie Sizer, Portland Police Chief. Stephanie Reynolds, Manager of the Crime Prevention Program. John Campbell, Campbell DeLong Resources. Thanks, Mayor, for uh, introducing today's SEPTED resolution. I'm going to talk briefly about the process uh, through which we arrived at the resolution, and then I'm going to turn it over to John to talk about the content of the resolution. So Stephanie and I are both co-chairs of the Interbureau Task Force, and one of the ideas the task force has long discussed is finding a way to cultivate SEPTED in Portland. It was in the spirit of that that ONI Crime Prevention coordinated a three-day training in January to introduce SEPTED to city employees and key bureaus, as well as personnel from TriMet and other agencies. With that groundwork in place, we began meeting in the spring with staff from Planning and Development Services to find a way forward in elevating SEPTED values without reinventing the wheel or conflicting with other city goals. We also kept BHCD and PDC apprised of our work as uh, housing projects entered that conversation. Through our meetings in the spring, we found that some SEPTED elements are already integrated into Portland's codes because they reinforce other values, such as uh, pedestrian-friendly amenities. This information helped us narrow our focus to three areas we recognize that would benefit the most from implementing SEPTED principles. Uh, they are first, city-funded development of any type, second, multifamily development, both public and private, and finally, other existing residential property. At the end of the day, we decided that the best approach would be to put our own house in order and work towards a resolution as a first step. Our goal was to require that any new multifamily building project or significant remodel project that receives city resources be required to include some very basic SEPTED principles in the design. We went through several iterations of a draft resolution internally with BDS and other stakeholders before we felt we had something solid enough in June to shop around to multi-house—I'm sorry—multi-family housing stakeholders uh, such as HAP and the Oregon Opportunity Network. The input we've received from HAP and Oregon on PDC and BHCD since the summer certainly has shaped the resolution significantly. I'll go over some of the important changes that we made in response. First, we added a process to waive SEPTED requirements if implementing them would result in a higher total cost of ownership to the city or if bureaus, uh, I'm sorry, or if it causes an unanticipated conflict with other regulations. We clarified remodeling requirements to make sure it is clearly understood that if a builder wasn't planning on replacing something, this resolution would not require it. We brought in PDC and BHCD for implementing SEPTED for city-funded property because as a funding agency, they are more familiar with housing developers' specific needs and have the ability to request these standards uh, be met earlier in the design process than can BDS. Um, which saves everyone time and money. And finally, we also adjusted some of the language and clarified some of the clauses to better emphasize the underlying purpose of the resolution. So I'm gonna, going to turn it over to John Campbell to talk about um, uh, some of that clarification and the language of the resolution and also the underpinnings of SEPTED. Thank you. Maybe I need to scoot down just slightly. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, is this picking up appropriately? Um, mm -hmm. yep. um, I'm John Campbell, and I would like to describe just briefly a little bit about some of the underpinnings of the specific SEPTED elements that are being addressed in this resolution, and then describe in brief the, uh, uh, the, the design concepts in the, uh, in the resolution. Um, first, we noted that crime doesn't happen everywhere equally. It concentrates where opportunity is provided, and specifically what we're referring to with that is work by Wesley Scogan out of the uh, out of Northwestern University, uh, 
the uh, problem oriented policing center and and actually many much other documentation uh, with what crime analysts look at and others determining that crime isn't a sort of evenly spread issue but there are specific places where the opportunity is greater also Robert Trojanowitz's work on the relationship between fear of crime and crime indicates that actually many people's average reaction to crime typically increases the likelihood of crime occurring because what we do at those places is isolate and pull in and um, tend to hide and create opportunities for crime. And so this is looking at some key things that create more community uh, connection and help uh, prevent crime uh, rather than uh, find ways to, uh, to identify it when it's happened. The goal is to, to make sure it doesn't happen in the first place. And there are some key findings associated with that, and I'll summarize those that relate directly to the, uh, to the SEPTED elements in this resolution, which Jeremy, Jeremy accurately described as, as very, very basic elements that would be uh, recommended for all properties. Um, those are, first of all, the designed in hiding places such as opaque fencing, dense foliage, or dark alcoves, that type of thing of property generally is going to increase the sense that one has an opportunity for concealment and therefore uh, may have a greater opportunity for crime and can also increase the sense of fear when people are going home at night and walking by, by places where they see dark hiding places and some of that. It reduces the livability for those individuals as well. Also, inconsistent lighting, creating glare blindness or deep pockets of shadows can be issues. And I think it's important to point out that in interviews with the neighborhood response team officers, they said repeatedly, the issue for us isn't the amount of light so much as that it is consistent. Because if we're going in and we get the light bright in our eyes and we can't see what's going on and people have places to hide in the darkness, that doesn't work as well. So this is not about increasing energy, increasing reducing the greenness of property, if you will, but looking at the consistency on some of those issues. And very frequently, um, uh, the issues in common areas. I've done a fair amount of work with uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development doing analysis at the low income subsidized and public housing. And unfortunately, there's a high consistency. When I am told about crime or assaults in laundry rooms, um, I almost don't need to look at them anymore to know that the issue is when you close the laundry room door, nobody walking by can see what's going on inside. And, uh, and it can be more dangerous things. So those types of things increase fear and increase the opportunity for crime and are things that are typically addressed in most multifamily housing today, but not always. And occasionally the city has funded property where there have been issues that have to be, be uh, retrofitted. Also, a very basic thing that should seem intuitively um, very straightforward is that emergency response is more likely and more rapid where address numbers can be read. And for example, we already require by code that there are lights that light up our address numbers. We don't require in our code that those lights be on. And uh, our recommendation is as the city's funding it that they would require that the, uh, that the lights be on at night, which makes it easier to report and identify the address number and certainly easier for emergency responders to find the location and arrive there more promptly as well. And certainly adds to safety from that standpoint. Um, in addition, in-home safety, both the feelings of safety and the actual safety improve when two basic elements are in place. And this is where I'm talking about individual residents in their own homes. One is the basic ability for any resident to be able to see who is at the door without having to open the door. And uh, just a basic fear issue and a basic knowing who's on the other side of the door should be fundamental and it's not currently required in our in our code and that resident doors and locks should be relatively difficult to kick in and force. This is not about banking hard steel doors and window bars or any of that, but simply solid core doors and good approved deadbolt locks or deadbolt locks are required in all, in all housing, but required in ones that meet crime prevention standards can be beneficial because they slow down access. They cause a perpetrator to feel like it'll take me longer to break in, so I'm more likely to be seen and uh, less likely to want to target this area. Um, so those are some of the, the key elements. In addition, I should say that management of property is certainly easier, and I've done a lot of work, as I think some of you know, with uh, managing properties around the, around the country. But management of property is easier when the, uh, when the preceding elements are addressed along with Making sure that on-site offices, if you're building an on-site office, how about situating it in a place where it is easy to see at least one of the entryways or some of the common area, but some sense that the person managing has some connection to the area as well. Um, we have seen properties where that has not been built in, but again, usually it is built in. And an obvious visual delineation between the public and private space. This is simply some type of psychological mar marker. It doesn't have to be a high fence, can be a low um, border hedge, can be even a low curb, something um, or a change in. Uh, color or texture of the, uh, of the sidewalk treatment simply so someone knows when they walk onto the property they're now in an area that is sort of in the domain of these residents and the management and that the rules may be different. But those are examples of markers that 
the crime prevention program will certainly be looking at whenever they're looking at multifamily property and often recommending changes to uh, to help turn their turn those properties around um, the, we knew that we we were aware of these things and looked at some of those things as common elements and in the challenge in putting together a resolution that would fit with Portland um, is recognizing first and I think it's important to emphasize that many private and publicly funded properties already address these issues but not all do so this isn't about a dramatic change with most properties it's about making sure that all properties um, that we are uh, publicly funding are coming up to these minimums. Um, it can be expensive to retrofit these, but it's essentially cost-free or cost-neutral to plan them from the start. It's pretty easy to put them in from the start, but it can be more expensive to retrofit. And that goes to a key element with the, uh, that the crime prevention program works on. The other elements necessary when there are problems at, at property uh, don't require retrofitting. Those elements are, of course, improved resident involvement, better resident relations, and improvements, changes, in management approaches and tone. Um, those don't require retrofitting, so this ensures of property uh, is consistent with those elements. Also, um, the value here was cost-efficient implementation. It's about thinking differently, not more expensively, and the um, housing providers were very insistent that we say that even more clearly, and so we made sure that we did, because that really is the value here. And the elements should be Portland compatible. The, the city is very well known for innovations in planning and design, and the intention here is to complement, not complicate. And uh, so we did, I, I think, uh, quite a bit of work with a number of stakeholders to make sure we weren't being redundant, we weren't developing regulations were, that were conflicting with other codes. With some of that as background, uh, the, to review what's in the resolution will um, be a really quick review based on uh, that will echo what I've just described. But there are two basic policy strategies. One is for city finance multifamily residential development and related remodels simply because in a resolution we can mandate those things. It would take about two years to develop code changes to mandate it in the private sector. So the concept is to, to be leaders here, to say we believe in this and so that we can make this happen in the uh, public sector and make it uh, and build the argument for um, for suggesting that these can be should be um, automatic in the private sector as well. The basic policy requirements, um, again, for city-funded property would be uh, requirements relating to outdoor walls, fences, hedges, or similar uh, types of barriers that they wouldn't provide a complete visual barrier. So examples are the built outdoor barriers um, should not be so opaque as to prevent awareness of an adult-sized person on the other side. Um, hedges above three feet will need to be not entirely opaque. They need to be able to, to, to see through. This is a dramatic change, frankly, from the type of SEPTED resolution uh, or ordinances we saw implemented around the country. Well, they'll see, say things like no vegetation between two and a half feet and six feet and something fairly dramatic. We said that doesn't sound like Portland. Let's just make sure that we're not creating those complete opaque barriers such as that high, thick laurel hedge, for example. And uh, we wanted to make sure there was considerable room for screening or territory markings that will allow for a strong sense of privacy without, um, uh, but still ensure that there is at least awareness of an adult-sized person on the other side of the uh, on the other side of the given barriers regarding lighting the concept is to minimize glare blindness um, and to leverage already required lighting to make sure it's installed in a way that avoids these those types of issues again it's not calling for necessarily more lighting but saying uh, to to look at the design issues associated with that and where lighting is used to uh, light up address numbers or certain types of recessed areas alcoves um, um, and uh, key areas where where it is appropriate to see access, such as a doorway, it should be on during the hours of darkness. Right now, the requirement again is that it's there, but not necessarily on. Um, in addition, transition from the public rights away, very basic requirement um, that there needs to be something, a change of pavement treatment or border landscaping or low fencing or something simply to indicate that psychological change from one one area to another. I mean, talks with PDC, they say they consistently recommend this, um, and it's. Uh, elements that they think are, are certainly valuable to have in, in housing as well. The common area facility should be laid out with visibility in mind. Um, the play area should be where activity can be seen by residents. Every once in a while we see play areas that are sort of an outer way place that creates too much concealment. Laundry rooms should allow for some means of visibility in and out so that it, it increases both the feeling of safety and the uh, perception that one can't get away with as much there. And on-site offices affording view of one or more exits. Uh, again, very commonly these things are done. Uh, Housing Authority of Portland, for example, uh, works to implement this and frankly much more security elements, but these are just some basic elements. And the final element uh, for what would be required in the City of Portland would be that doors should effectively meet what's already in Title 33 offered as an amenity bonus. That is to say, Title 33 doesn't require these elements, but says that if developers uh, put in eye viewers or 
or some method to see who's at the door and meets certain basic door security requirements, which is why you see a fair amount of specificity in that in the resolution, that if those things are met, then the city will grant an amenity bonus, which allows the developer to create to develop more units, greater density in the same area. So certainly it benefits the uh, um, and the city um, taking a lead and saying that uh, valuing uh, both the ability to uh, uh, to provide additional units of affordable housing and to provide this kind of security, um, we would uh, we would think makes sense. Sense. Um, that basically summarizes the basic requirements that would be for required for city funded property in the private sector multifamily development again uh, with absence of the ability to go through a full code process what we can do at this point is and i'll simply reveal this because this really summarizes the entire policy is to provide de developers of three dwelling units or more of multifamily property non-binding septet recommendations that would at minimum include the same recommendations that we that you just saw for policy strategy one for all um, for all private sector, we certainly hope that uh, through this process um, that it would be uh, that would be encouraged that this would be done more consistently. Um, ONI has a program in place that would certainly encourage private developers to do this very consistently from the start as well. But this goes as far as we can go at this point uh, to sort of start setting that tone, if you will. Regarding the implementation policy, and there was much discussion from the housing providers about making sure that this was put in appropriately, uh, the, the concept is that the procedures and practices would be the responsibility of ONI, but frankly in heavy partnership with um, the development services, housing and community development, police, fire, uh, planning, uh, PDC, and the housing authority, um, with particular emphasis with those dealing with housing elements. And frankly, part of the resolution is a method that raises and improves the conversation between the, the traditional silo of those who work in public safety and crime prevention um, and those who work in housing development and, uh, and management as well. And this, uh, this will certainly uh, help facilitate that. The basic elements of the plan that are called for in that is that ONI would report back to you within six months with a plan that, would, that they would have worked out essentially with PDC, BHCD, and uh, with BDS that would to the fullest extent possible extend neither the number of days nor the number of meetings required for any developer involved in doing this. So we're not taking more of their time in doing this unless absolutely critical. So there's going to be a stiff test for that essentially that would implement the city funded property requirements in partnership with the funding agency. And this was a very important to the housing providers saying, look, we already know how to work with P uh, PC and BHCD and they can inform us of these requirements and set those much earlier in the process than in the permitting process. And that would implement the private sector elements through BDS, which is essentially providing, at minimum, providing that information that we described. Um, it would allow for waivers for elements that result in a greater total cost of ownership for the city, uh, which, frankly, we don't expect that to occur. But we wanted to reassure that this really isn't about, in, uh, we don't expect it to occur very often, I guess I should say. Um, we, um, it really is something that should be cost neutral or a cost savings to the city. But if that's the case, that there definitely would be a process to provide that. And also, un anticipated or costly conflicts with other regulations um, that would allow for a waiver for that. Um, no matter how much we review everything to make sure we're compliant with every regulation, there will likely be some things that come up as surprises or some things that aren't sufficiently clear and need, uh, need clarity with that. We heard from developers who said, look, Sometimes we'll get two different regulations, they conflict, and we're told that we have to figure out how to work it out. What we're saying in this resolution is if this conflicts with other city regulations, it's up to the city to work it out. That is, say, it's up to implementers only and the, the partnership team to say, okay, we'll figure out how to flex to make that work because we're trying to avoid it being a greater barrier on those different elements. Um, and that, uh, that essentially is a fairly hasty review of a very lengthy process and uh, some uh, good basic elements with that. So. With that, I'll turn to Jeremy, um, and then you yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here from the Portland Police Bureau to give a ringing endorsement for can, the resolution and the work of the task force. Um, as you all know, the Portland Police Bureau re responds when things go wrong, and uh, we often respond to what we call chronic calls for service locations, many times in multifamily dwellings. When that happens, we ask NERD officers in particular um, to work with cr crime prevention and other city bureaus uh, to achieve a couple things. One of them is a septed analysis of the problem location, looking at things like doors and lighting, egress and ingress. And additionally, we work with management to improve screening of applicants and promote community of, of involvement among tenants. 
SEPTEB principles, as it's already been pointed out, are clearly very cheap in the design phase. Um, they are not expensive at all. Um, they are certainly less expensive than the cost of victimization both to the community and to individuals and the cost of a criminal justice system, a police response to crime and disorder. And they make people feel safe and they make them safer. SEPTED principles are, are really a huge no-brainer. Fortunately, there's not a lobby here against them. Um, and I applaud the work of the task force and the mayors and the city council's leadership on this issue. I think this is long overdue and very well welcomed. Yes. So I, I think this is very, <clears throat> very thoughtful work. Is it possible to, and maybe you, you alluded to this, Chief Size, in your comments, and I, I'm just so fixated on Turkey tomorrow, I can hardly <laughs> pay attention. Um, that you in the Bureau, when you get repeat calls for service at a location based on what you think is a undue influence of environmental factors to its vulnerability for crime, that you follow up on that? Yeah, actually we do. Um, we identify uh, chronic calls for service location. Um, we n usually at that point um, involve a nerd officer in crime prevention. Our strong recommendation to management is that they do uh, have crime prevention do a SEPTED review and put together a remediation plan for any problems that are identified. Um, are they required to do that? They're not required to do it. But what happens through the chronic um, nuisance ordinance, right. if they get a certain quotient of calls for service, there is a mechanism in the city that is kind of arduous um, and time consuming, but generally people c comply when um, there's a sense that there would be a possibility that their um, basically property rights might be impacted. So I think generally we get fairly good um, compliance through that process. I think it's a great improvement that, um, that there's greater consistency that um, these dwellings are built using SEPTED principles so we don't get there in the first place. I was just would thinking. you agree? I, I, oh, I would absolutely agree. I, um, I have some things, some comments that I was going to add as oh, well. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. Um, I was going to say that the experiences of, of the crime prevention staff really mirror the experiences of the officers. When officers go to these chronic call locations, they really very quickly identify some very basic physical problems with the property that are, that are very easy to pick out. Our staff does the same thing. We notice it right away. Um, we get called out to do a septed evaluation of a property about 100 times a year. At least that's what it was this last fiscal year. Um, and we do these at both public and private properties, um, housing for all income levels. It just doesn't really does, doesn't matter. If there are certain design elements that are lacking, they are quite likely to have some kind of crime problem. And so we go to the property. We meet up with the manager or the owner or both. We do a tour around the property, and we're looking for very specific um, physical signs that there might be a problem there. We're looking for lighting levels, fencing, landscaping, signage, um, the physical layout of the property. And we make recommendations to the people who control that property about things that they might change. And I've got to say the things that we recommend are almost always the exact same things that you find in this resolution. It's um, increased or improved lighting levels. It's improved visibility. Um, improved um, eyesight on crucial shared common areas. Um, and I've got to say it's a lot easier to implement these things, just like the chief was saying. It's so much easier to implement these things when a building is first built than it is to retrofit them later on. Um, and I also want to say that the experiences of the community match the experiences of officers and our staff. They also notice those specific dark alcoves, low lighting levels, um, overgrown shrubbery, and they, they don't think about it in the same way that we do, but it makes them nervous. And we, we get a lot of calls from people who are anxious to use their property or to pass through a certain area because they find that it they feel anxious as they go through there. They feel vulnerable. Um, when I was running the Women's Strength Program at the Police Bureau, extremely common for women to complain to us that they felt uncomfortable doing their laundry at night in their apartment complex because they didn't like to go into that room because you could not see into it or out of it. 
So I've, over the years, heard many, many complaints from people about the same sorts of physical conditions that we're talking about that could so easily be prevented from the get-go with a resolution like this. Um, the chief was alluding to a program that our, our um, crime prevention staff implement that we've been doing for about three years called Enhanced Safety Properties. And this is a program that's a combination of SEPTED improvements, um, management training, and resident organizing that has had just a really magical effect almost on the properties where we've implemented it. And it was first piloted in North Portland and Havala Frischweiler, who's back there in the bright red coat, um, she is our staff member who has been working the longest with ESP properties. And what she found as she was working with these properties is that initially the calls for service to the police go up a little bit because residents now know how to call for help and then they just plunge because of the combination of the SEPTED, the management improvements, and the resident organizing. And SEPTED is, I, I know this is a very tired analogy, but it's one leg of a three-legged stool. And the physical improvements to a property make a huge difference in terms of the safety there. So um, to conclude, our crime prevention staff is very much in favor of this resolution. Um, we feel like it's long overdue. It's something we wanted for a long time, and we really feel like the passage of a resolution like this will lead to reduced fear of crime for residents reduce experience of crime for residents, um, greater ease of place management for apartment managers, um, less expense for building owners because they won't have to make as many repairs and they'll have more stable longer term tenants because their tenants aren't afraid and moving on. And finally, less work for emergency responders and long term problem solvers alike. So uh, we're very excited about this and we're looking forward to uh, continuing our work in a Portland where we have more complexes that are safer by design. You, um the SEPTED analysis, you said you do over 100 a year. Is that available to homeowners too? Or, I mean, if somebody calls and says, I want a SEPTED analysis? Generally, yes, particularly if they have experienced some kind of a crime. So if somebody's, for example, been burglarized, we'll go over to their house and do it for them. We're also working on some um, sort of do-it-yourself SEPTED guidelines so that people can analyze their own living space or office space. Um, I know you've been working with the development community, nonprofit, for profit, and HAP over some of the issues that were raised, and you've addressed them in the in the resolution. I appreciate that, but there's some questions I'd like to pose just to clarify the scope and and the mechanics of how this works. Um, and I'm not sure who I should direct it to, so I'll just frame the questions. And whoever it might be, John, you may be the one who I don't know, but sure. Um, could, could someone explain to me how the waiver process works, who grants the waiver, and what is the uh, due process rights, if any, to someone who uh, is aggrieved if a, if a waiver isn't granted? Um, I suppose the short answer to your question is no, um, as, as far as the, the, um, the, what the resolution calls for uh, is that uh, ONI with PDC and BHCD would work together to define what that is and come back with that plan to council and say, here's how we've worked that out. And the idea is that um, with those ho housing partners at the table, um, it isn't that ONI simply makes up the waiver process and says this is how it is. The waiver process is something that would ultimately be managed by um, BHCD and PDC and would need to meet their experience of what works appropriately in housing and their architectural elements. But there is I would say there's, so there's further um, working out those details and reporting back. So what the resolution calls for is that that process will be worked out and that ONI will need to come back with an implementation plan that, that specifies that. So that's the status of okay. that at this point. But yeah, very, very important thing to have, but that's, but yeah, I guess the technical answer is no. <laughs> so um, Next, uh, this uh, by design uh, would apply to city financed development. Now, as I was thinking about the definition of city finance, it could take you in many interesting directions. And so I guess, uh, have you thought about what would be the threshold of financial <clears throat> investment which would trigger this? And uh, would it also apply to all the direct and indirect ways which the city finances development? For example, would it be triggered by, I mean, some might argue that an abatement is a way we finance. Some might even argue that certain kinds of zoning changes or incentives, in effect, contribute. I'm just curious, what's the trigger and how broad is the scope of the financing? 
I'm glad you asked that question, and that is something that we considered when we were designing the resolution. And we made a distinction between hard resources such as financing and soft resources such as uh, a tax abatement or, or a zoning application or something like that. Um, what I can say for certain is that um, in cases of hard resources that, that are provided to a development, those would definitely trigger this resolution for certain. Um, softer resources such as uh, an abatement, um, that's something, again, that, that we would want to um, correspond with BHCD and PDC about to see if, there's no, if there is an appropriate venue to do that. No, I'm, I am one who favors bright lines, even if I disagree with them. But as we know, for example, there's an ongoing debate about what's the trigger for prevailing wage residential versus commercial rates, for example, in, in, in construction, and that's a live debate. So I think as we develop the rules, we want to think about what's the what's the minimum, what's the floor in terms mm -hmm. of contribution? Is it maybe a two PSH units in a, in a building that otherwise is market? Does that trigger? And then so what's I guess there's probably a de minimis or a, a, a floor that triggers, and then mm -hmm. then uh, defining clearly what are the hard financing uh, mechanisms which which trigger the language, and <clears throat> I'm sure the folks you're going to be talking to at BHCD, which is my bureau. PDC and elsewhere will have a lot of good thinking uh, on that subject. If I could echo on that, I do. I, uh, the concept is, is aligned with what you are describing, and I see it as related to that, that waiver question as well. So, uh, so certainly defining a bright line and saying, look, from all practical purposes, below this or these kinds of situations, it's not worth going, it's not worth applying. It might be, uh, might relate to that question as well. But yes, that would be uh, only PDC and BHCD um, specifying what those elements are and coming back and reporting to your satisfaction on that. Right. And I, while I, I think that is probably an easier task than the related task, which is to put some content on the notion of the trigger for remodeling, upgrading, or replacement. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that one's going to be harder because how much of a remodel would trigger a septed requirement and is it limited to the area that's being remodeled or does it trigger the whole um, uh, uh, development and, and, and what's the mechanism? That, that strikes me as being even more challenging. Actually, it, it may be, but our perception is that one's actually, if anything, less challenging because we were very specific in here compared to the, for example, ADA requirements. Until your property's up to ADA, you have to spend X percentage of the investment on ADA and that type of thing. We didn't want to apply that here. The requirement here is simply when that specific thing is being remodeled. So if you're replacing the doors, then the new doors going in have I to buy viewers. Or so if you're remodeling the laundry room. If you're remodeling the laundry room, put a window in it. Yeah, that type of thing. But it's only for that specific element. So it's not the and, and it's it's not like other development funding triggers that says once you spend X, then you're going to have to do these things on these other other areas that you wouldn't have touched otherwise. No, it's very specifically if you're doing it, if you're remodeling something that is directly covered by the resolution, uh, then yeah, when you redo the laundry room or you're going to place it somewhere else, now let's talk about making sure there's visibility. And so that's a great concept. This yeah. is very basic, but so just so I understand the way this would work, if you did a remodel and BDS would not give you the permit until you had presented some kind of plan that indicated you understood that SEPTEV was, was required to be integrated into what you're doing along with everything else? Um, actually, a little differently from that one because it's PDC or BHCD would say before we fund that remodel, uh, we want to see a plan that does those, those elements. I see, and, because it's and just so, specific to so the it's public. Just, yeah, it's just specific to the public uh, and, 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 and I've, I'm going to ask you a question that's a rhetorical question. I know the answer, but I think it's helpful for our audience to, to know how you would answer this question, which is what, what would you say to people who, question, who wonder why is it, or why are we singling out just this one area of multifamily housing, for example, which is the publicly subsidized housing? Are, are we somehow saying that the folks who live there are more prone to crime and these kinds of things than people who live in non-subsidized housing? And, it's meant to give you an opportunity to knock that down. Yeah, and and let me say, and others can respond. Let me say very clearly, I consult with both types of housing, and none of us are here to say that publicly funded housing is in is in worse shape or is more crime problems or those types of things. Yeah, I'm I'm not going to argue that it's necessarily better consistently either, but I am. But it's a chance for leadership, a chance for the city to say we think these are important. Let's demonstrate 
that this is simple to implement and makes sense for anything that we are publicly funding so that we're not um, so that it doesn't raise our expenses at a later date and that type of thing. Let's demonstrate that so it makes it easier and raises the argument to do it in privately funded housing as well. Um, if we could have done the same thing as easily for privately funded multifamily housing, I would absolutely say it's, it would be a no-brainer that we would be arguing that as well here right now today. It's, it's no, no, no statement here about an issue with publicly funded housing being a problem, but it's about uh, leadership by example and saying that's let's let's show the best of what we can be uh, so yeah let me I hope I've knocked that one down as you requested but thank you yeah so, so this is um, the this is a binding resolution and it's very expansive <clears throat> in what it would call for and there's a fair amount of work still to be done that will return to council, is that right? The next. That's correct, it would be only reporting back to council in six months time. And also I, I would add that. What are they reporting back on exactly? Um, the implementation steps that, that they're going to be working out with uh, PDC and BHCD. Does it make sense to do some pilot work first before we, I mean it seems to me we wanna try some of this stuff out and that's one question. The other question is, I think we have a hundred and, in terms of current dwellings in the city of Portland, it's like over 130 or something, and we permit about 2,000 new ones a month, probably none for the past couple of months. So I go back to the existing sort of um, dwelling issue and then the calls for service and sort of frequent calls to existing dwellings where nothing has happened. I would be interested in your thoughts on coming up with one pilot is to work with uh, the most frequent calls for service where we might have done a septep, a septep analysis and nothing happened and then also other aspects of this that we could pilot before we we, we finalize the, the implementation um, rules. Well the way the resolution is written right <clears throat> now we actually went back two years to find if, if, this, if this had been implemented two years ago, how many properties would be affected? And we found actually it was only 12. Um, so. For new construction. For new construction, exactly. And, um, and it's, it, was it was following in that that we actually approached this as a pilot project. Um, and then built into that six months after reporting, um, we can certainly accommodate some of the interests that you're, that you're describing. You went back and did a forensic sort of analysis of how many units would be sort of covered. How many properties? How many properties. Now, how is that a pilot? Well, no, I'm sorry. What we're looking at, what we're proposing right now would be, in essence, a pilot project because we are, we're keeping this narrow scope and we're reporting back on it in six months to gauge its effectiveness. Oh, I thought you were coming back to us with implementation. <laughs> Uh, rules within the next six months. I think we are coming back, we being a very broad term, but coming back within six months with an implementation plan saying here's what's been worked out with that um, and uh, reporting back from that standpoint. But between now and when that implementation plan comes back, are we, are we going to have four new developments and four existing development retrofits to <coughs> pilot how this how your emerging rules would actually to inform the emerging rules? I, I guess I'm not following. If, are, are, you, are you wondering if these rules are really useful or valid and so we need to test those more? I'm not quite understanding what the, which part you want to pilot. Let me just say what I, my take on this is you, you do this, you come up with some implementation rules. This is a sort of a vision document come up with implementation is how to achieve these goals. Ideally, we pilot them before we broadly require it on all future city buildings or buildings in which the city has investments in. When you do some pilots on some new construction uh, types of uh, implementation and then some uh, retrofit where we're getting sig significant calls for service as well. And on the retrofit, I mean, I'm interested in streamlining your ability to require 
improvements on the existing buildings and retrofits, but I don't want to do that broadly until we've sort of tried it out on a few, both, again, new construction and existing construction. I don't know about Stephanie, but I think on the issue of a chronic calls for service location and then this intervention that we do together, that we need to chew on that issue a little bit because I would hate to have a, a um, as a consequence of the fear of being penalized for not implementing the recommendations that people find a way to avoid having that survey done. Um, and then to really... Um, no, no, I want to clarify, if I could, Chief. What I'm saying is there's the people that call you out voluntarily. That's no penalty. They do that. I'm talking about where we get called out, where our police officers are repeatedly called out to the same locations that your folks believe improvements in the environment would reduce crime. So I, I separate those. Volunteer voluntary bring people in, uh, the SEPTEP people in versus we're spending a lot of money going back to the same place because it's poorly designed, poorly lit. You know, I, one of the things I, I, I'm talking to you folks as this was progressing is that already um, ONI's crime prevention does a number of voluntary assessments, both for new construction and remodeling. Yes, about 100 a year. So, yeah. so we, we already have a number of examples how it works in both. In fact, I think, I, I, is, is it Havala? Could you come forward? Because I, I think you have a very interesting story to tell about one specific example and what the effect was because, so, yes. So before we take her testimony, can we just nail down? Can, okay. I, I'm just, I don't want to lose the track the, because the, he's raised an issue that I'm interested in, but maybe for a different reason. Can I pursue that trail before sure. we? So I, I, Commissioner Adams has asked a couple of questions which now, I guess I'm confused about just the timeline. So if we were to adopt this today, at what point would the administrative rules be worked out? And what, what's, your, what's your timeline to work out the rules before this is implemented? How long would it take you to, to, to get the rules hammered out? I think the answer is six months. Within okay. six months. I'm so, sorry, I confused that because I, I misunderstood the initial question. Right. So apologies. that means that in six months, you would be coming back to us with a set of rules and if there's, presumably, we could ask you to, we could ask you to come back in six months with those rules. If there's some heartburn in the community, we could discuss it and give you some feedback. If not, it would then, at some point after the six months, you would then phase this in, correct? Mm -hmm. And now to Commissioner Adams's point about a pilot, uh, my sense is that if the, and I'm just, I'm, I'm trying engaging the conversation. I'm not fixed on this, but my sense is that if we have a flexible waiver strategy, and the, the waiver is really an honest waiver, that in effect that that will that will work like a pilot regulator. It will it will take certain development out of the of the equation because of the cost factor, leaving others. But the reality is. What, what I'm overall concerned about is I'm not sure how much development there's going to be to test this anyway. So to the, to the question about a pilot, I, I'm, I'm concerned that we may end up in six months have these rules. We may test them, and there may not be much, uh, many cranes in the air uh, for a year thereafter if the economy doesn't improve. So, uh, but, but I would say that from my point of view, the waiver actually could, could perform a very useful mm -hmm. role in in separating out which projects this would apply to. And my guess is that it wouldn't cover that many in the short term unless there's a, uh, an incredible rebound of our economy and the credit, and the credit markets. Just I think that's absolutely correct. Well, I just want to, I mean, I have more to learn on this, but my interest in this is reducing calls for service. And it might be the easiest thing as new construction is built but I'd be willing to bet that as a percentage, new construction just because of modern day design is probably just organically probably better, not always, but I would say a higher percentage of new construction might be better than a percentage of old construction since the vast majority of the city is going to remain existing construction. I'm interested in sort of the reverse engineering of calls for service. Some calls repeat calls for service. Locations that repeat calls for service have nothing to do with the environment, physical environment could have something to do with the way they're operated. It could have some other reasons, who knows, but 
I'm interested in but, that piece of this as well. If I may offer, during, during this process, uh, one of the ideas, and there, there is some ideas developed around what to do with existing property and looking at, you don't go to people who already have their, you know, whether it's a single family home, a duplex, or multifamily, and saying, oh yeah, those were the codes in place then, but now you got to do something different. But there was some discussion about how to incent that and how to make those things happen. I would, and there's some interesting concepts with that. Um, I wouldn't do those at all instead of this resolution. I think this is a good good baseline, a good beginning step. I think that's certainly a discussion that can be can be held as well. Some very interesting ideas came through that process, um, and I agree would make a substantial difference to the city and not just calls for service. I mean, yes, on the calls for service police side and also on the general livability and feelings of safety side, which should go hand in hand. So well, we, we find plenty of property owners for grass is too tall, paint is peeling, and um, I believe that whatever we can do on the chronic nuisance side related to protecting people's lives and property, it should be just as fair but as easy and hard as to, to grass, grass that's tall and peeling paint. That's my point. I, get it, I can get excited about this if I know it's going to be used where it's needed most and in a, in a pretty straightforward way. If it's more of a feel-good policy, that's good too. And new construction, it's always good to improve upon it. I don't think our biggest problem is new construction. I think it's the existing city. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I want to say that it's there are city-funded properties that we built in the last 15 years that didn't have some of these things that are then looking at some issues associated with that. And, we, and so it is, this is simply saying, let's make sure that our properties going forward are always an example of that. There are also many city funded properties that, that do a great job with all of these, all of these issues. Uh, so it, this is simply saying, let's make sure that we're always an example of the best way to do that and to insert septet into the conversation uh, more rigorously. Uh, but to suggest that this is, I, I guess I would. I think I speak for all of us. We see this as a as a great way, of first step to be get get that conversation going. But exactly what you're talking about is, I'm talking about. I, I'm miscommunicating. I'm talking about the non-city pr properties. Well, I, I think that that Havel's and, experience with our enhanced safety properties um, in North Portland is, I think, a very good illustration of this. These were all pre-existing properties. Some of them were publicly funded. Some of them were not. Um, multiple different income levels living in these properties. And Havel has been working with these folks for close to three years now, and has they've really experienced a dramatic difference in their properties through the combination of the septet improvements, the management improvements, and the resident organizing. And Havel, I don't know if you want to speak to what their experience has been. Yeah, and I think it may touch on, on one of your concerns as well about piloting, because part of the, our program, in fact, our it's a three-phase program, but the second phase is doing a septet. And so we actually have piloted, piloted this septed at those properties and again some of them were um, housing authority of portland properties some of those are privately owned so we we had you know a mixture of you know backgrounds some of them have mixed use mixed um levels working or um mixed income levels at the properties and it's it's been very successful but i think you're right and that's part of one of the things that we've worked on with those chronic nuisance properties is this program that we're doing is not just for you know, problem locations, but we're, we do it with all properties. Any landlord that wants to work with us in trying to make their, their community safer, we're going to work with them on this. And so we've used that SEPTED component as, a you know, like I said, the second piece of it, and it's really made a dramatic difference at those properties. And again, all of those are built properties, you know, so we didn't have those starting from the beginning. We do do septeds for some of, um, I've done them um, on request from uh, private land, uh, private developers to public in the past, just in our regular, you know, meeting them at neighborhood associations. But this program is, I think, kind of a piece of both of that. It's piloted our septed and it's also um, talked, it, it's really addressed those chronic properties or those chronic nuisance properties that we've had as well as working with other properties that don't have problems on a really truly prevention-based program where we're working with properties to help make them safer. By the way, just, just to clarify something, this council has from time to time sought either the Housing Authority of Portland or a nonprofit to take over a troubled development that was done without any public resources. And that's why there are developments, properties on the portfolios of both the Housing Authority of Portland and some of our nonprofits, which are troubled. 
one of the things that we're going to have to think about going forward is we don't want to use have SEPTEP become a deterrent for some either public or nonprofits assuming the management of some of these troubled buildings because we you obviously would not want a scenario where the housing authority at our suggestion or direction takes over a troubled development and then is told oh by the way you're out of compliance with SEPTED uh, or at least people need to understand that there's going to be a need for resources to actually uh, be put into these to, to meet these goals. Yeah. I would just say emphatically that that's those are those are the kinds of scenarios that we were very careful with this resolution that there shouldn't there shouldn't be a sting or a gotcha associated with that and that is where the waiver concept comes in and it really is this this is the, the kinds of things that typically builders think of our expensive from a crime prevention standpoint are much more invasive than these kinds of things. You know, building, I don't know, what closed circuit surveillance systems or those kinds of things, which I generally would never recommend um, or very rarely recommend. Um, so, no, this is this is a question of EVS, once the housing authority takes over a property, if they're going to now replace all the doors, then we're going to look at can you put in eye viewers, but if that looks like it's going to substantially increase costs, it's a little bit of a hypothetical that I don't think would be true. I think the housing authority consistently does these things because they know they're valuable. So, you know, uh, but yes, that, that kind of protection should be already in place with the way we wrote this because that was so important not to make it a barrier from that standpoint. One of the um, elements when you talk about troubled property is that usually you can look at one of three or all three elements, and one is it's been poorly managed. Two is that they have problem tenants, and so the tenants really aren't engaged in helping maintain a safety. And then the third is SEPTED. So it can be any one or all of those combinations when you're looking at a troubled piece of property. Um, outside of the physical construction, that is, it's, it's poorly made, regardless of SEPTED. Um, those are the three elements that you, you would look at to try to correct. And unfortunately, in the city of Portland, we can only go so far with that third one, SEPTED is that we can change management. We can um, um, evict tenants that aren't cooperative. But when it gets down to ensuring that uh, that housing unit is safe by SEPTED standards, uh, which is a known factor in terms of, of reducing uh, the, the crime, the potential for crime, that to me is, is the essential part of what we're discussing today. Is it? And coming back in six months is that there's there's many years of actual testing of this product. It's the process and making sure that the process is fair and meets the needs of the city council and the community and and the development community. I think is is and we've got six months to work that out. And can I just add? I think that's an interesting concept. I think we need to discuss it more in terms of which concept on uh, the concept of. Um, chronic nuisance locations and implementation of the SEPTED principles and have a dialogue about what seems to be the impediments. Is it just resistance on the part of management? Is there a cost element? So I think we can have that dialogue and then come forward with a recommendation and maybe the chronic nuisance ordinance can be modified to have the capacity to do the work because I think this issue is much more broad than just uh, multiple family dwellings. I can think of yeah. grocery stores and convenience stores Absolutely. and taverns and that have um, issues that really are um, broader and um, often as persistent mm -hmm. as the ones we're describing today. Honestly, I mean, we started with a we started with a with a much larger vision, and uh, the, the feedback was. <laughs> Only so many stakeholders at a time, and let's start getting the let's start let's get this on the table. Let's prove with our with our city funding housing, very frankly, in our view, very easy way to to prove this and elevate the argument so that when it comes time to say, can we change code so that we do it in private sector housing, which takes a little longer, and prove that and take the lead on that, we have created the argument for that, and it's 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 in a sense a beginning or the concept is this could could this be a beginning of introducing these kinds of concepts just the way fire codes have been introduced over the last hundred years um, we all know what a fire hazard is but not many know what a crime hazard is and so this this is seen as a step and um, a good one but I, I couldn't agree with you more on the, the issues that you're talking about as far as how can we happy to talk about those issues as well just conceptually um, and so, so for so just I'll summarize from my point of view. I'm interested in hearing about um, 
the enforcement of this. So you've you've stated that in terms of how do you provide fairness and the ability of people to respond to concerns, but then if they don't, what's a reasonable, after a reasonable timeline, a reasonable request, then how do we make it happen? Because again, if, if you believe in these principles, it means that we're letting something dangerous to property and, and life uh, continue um, that could be a lot more dangerous than a lot of other things we currently find property owners for. That's one thing. The second thing is that we have limited resources. And so how do you prioritize? How do we be proactive? How do we catch these things as they're happening or before they're happening, but at least based on the existing reporting systems? And how is our, the information flowing in analyzed and or filtered automatically to prioritize these things? Now, politically, we're with this resolution, we're saying that we will start with that which we own or influence. And we're doing that for political reasons. And I guess that is a pilot, in a way, base. And you've you've mentioned now that you this is actually the work of pilot. You didn't get into any details, so I don't know that, but I trust you. I mean, I, you you've this has been done in other places. I'm a little concerned. It'd be great in the next six months if we're going to do that. That's one thing. But I would also just like to know the top ten places, top twenty places. Just a, just like I keep an eye on the top twenty five most dangerous intersections in the city. If there are twenty five places in the city that are septep vulnerable, you know they're they're criminally vulnerable or public safety vulnerabilities based on environmental design, whether it's public or private. I'd like to know that. By the way, I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, there's some people in the uh, housing community that have pushed push back and you've engaged them and um, for me the decision to go on a limited basis with as Commissioner Adams said properties that we own or influence is is not a quote unquote political decision it's based on the rea on the notion that to change the code as applicable to private sector uh, to uh, to non-public housing I think I understand you say it would take a couple of years to go through that process. So, in effect, by by applying these rules to that which we influence through our funding, we are in effect getting a pilot program for the first couple of years. And I, I view that less. I just want to be clear because there's some people who are concerned about the politics of this. I, I view that less as a political decision and one about a timing question. And that you've made the argument that let's try it here on things we influence for a couple of years and then migrate to to properties that are privately funded but which would require a more elaborate process of changing the code is that is that absolutely absolutely but I, absolutely. I would and my understanding is we could apply this to the private sector within six to eight months we are politically piloting it on our own property first showing and that's politically by leading by example and others but I would like to know what private sector only uh, places, vulnerable places out there, septet places are out there that um, we would apply to it next. I'm assuming that this will not just apply to publicly owned or influenced dangerous places. I'm interested, I think the council is interested in going after the dangerous places and relieving our officers of repeat calls for service unnecessarily. When I was at Southeast Precinct, we ran calls for service um, uh, information for the most recurrent calls for lo service locations. At that time, uh, the number one location was Providence Hospital, and it was because of a car prowl <coughs> problem um, in their parking structure. And so we worked on that. The second one was Laurelhurst Park. And so we worked with the Park Bureau and Crime Prevention to do remediation <coughs> from a SEPTED standpoint on the park in terms of trim, trimming shrub, uh, shrubbery and there had been a kind of a party location on the park that was mitigated. So there's good work to be done. Generally, the people we work with are compliant and we can certainly look at those that aren't and then also examine the reasons why they're not. Thank you. Good. Further questions? Jeremy? I was just going to ask if there were further questions, so um, if there's not, thank you very much. Would you like to ask? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, visions of turkey dancing. <laughs> How many folks do we have signed up to testify? We have two people signed up. Would you please call their names? If uh, Marlena Lutino and Rachel Russell would come on up.
Thanks for being here, folks. When you speak, please state your name for the record, and you each have three minutes. Anyone can begin. Okay. Um, so my name is Marlea Lutino, and I'm the asset manager with Catholic Charities. Um, and I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to testify on crime prevention through environmental design resolution. Um, I'm here to testify on behalf of the Oregon Opportunity Network. Um, it's a statewide network of over 40 affordable housing providers and owners in the state of Oregon. Our members consider security an essential part of the responsible stewardship of affordable housing and maintaining vibrant communities. We would like to recognize Mayor Potter for the unprecedented resources that he has put forward to support affordable housing within the city of Portland. We wholeheartedly <clears throat> applaud his efforts and thank him for his role in our successes. We wish him the best as he transitions out of public life. In general, Oregon On is supportive of the SEPTED resolution and the aim of its principles. Some of our members already incorporate SEPTED principles into their developments. As one example, Rose CDC seeks Office of Neighborhood Environmental, oh, excuse me, seeks Office of Neighborhood Invol Involvement Crime Prevention Coordinator Review as part of the design development process for every project they complete. Our members had initial concerns with an early iteration of the SEPTED draft resolution. We believe our concerns have been addressed. We are therefore opposing no opposition to this resolution going forward. Um, as affordable housing providers and owners, we are disciplined in using language that avoids reinforcing a stereotypic belief that low-income people are more likely to engage in criminal activity than moderate or high-income people. Some SEPTED principles will be exclusively applied to city-funded affordable housing. The general, um, excuse me, the general public could misconstrue the aim of the policy. We urge you to continue to promote positive language as the policy moves forward. Oregon On looks forward to assisting in SEPTED implementation so that we may spread these positive principles to other multifamily communities in Portland. If I could just uh, sure. ask you two points. One is, my understanding is this would apply to publicly funded multifamily housing, whether it's low income, market rate, or workforce. So that, that will partly address, I think, the concern, but I, we want to make it very clear that there, and, and it's an issue I raised with the panel before you, that there is no intent to stigmatize any particular group, and, that, and we'll continue to message that through what we do. But the second question I wanted to ask you was, has to do with Esperanza Court. Oh, okay. And I had the pleasure of joining you at the opening of that, and um, uh, Esperanza Court is a state-of-the-art affordable housing development. Uh, do you know offhand how much of the SEPTED principles were incorporated just as a matter of course in the design for that particular development? Um, <clears throat> my my guess is that it was heavily influenced by SEPTED. I mean, given the layout, the lighting, uh, some of the intentional things that were done, my, my guess is it probably naturally incorporated much of it, but I was curious if, if you knew specifically. Um, <clears throat> I think most affordable housing developments, for example, do have those peepholes. So that wouldn't be such a, a such such a hard thing to integrate into any new or existing properties. For example, um, as far as lighting and recesses, I don't know exactly. Actually, I think um, the person from PDC, Michael Michael, do you know? Most of it. Yeah. Well, and I just say one one thing that impressed me when we did the walkthrough mm -hmm. is that it is designed so that lots of people who live there become busybodies. Yes, it's it's right on uh, Powell, so it has a you know it has a it's on the bus line. And if you're in your apartment or on your deck, you have a chance to look at common areas. you uh, you can observe the children's play structure. I mean, so you've got lots of eyes. Yes. On what's going on? There's a central courtyard. Which I take it is part of the SEPTED principle. So, thank you. Yes. My name is Rachel Russell. I work for the Housing Authority of Portland. Um, I've been there for eight years. I just actually recently joined um, the public housing one year ago, and I just started a new position um, as an assistant property manager. And one of my primary roles was to work with the police and um, make our meetings with them maybe more cohesive. A lot of our site managers are very active in going to the different um, NRT and ONI meetings. So. Um, we want to uh, continue with that. We also um, are in high support of the SEPTED resolution. Uh, we have been using John Campbell for trainings and have had our uh, newer developments already implemented SEPTED, New Columbia, and most recently Humboldt Gardens. Um, 
the housing authority is the largest provider of low-income housing in, in the county, obviously, and uh, I think we're interested in doing that on even the existing properties. We've started to have um, some septed um, inspections. Some of the people in this room actually have um, evaluated some of our properties, some of it informally and some of it more formally. Um, but we're very interested in support the policy. I'm going to read a little bit from some points that a coworker who was going to be here today um, gave to me. So um, the SEPTED principles addressed in the resolution are supported by HAP and have been implemented our new developments. Um, partnerships have been forged between Portland Police Bureau and the Office of Neighborhood Involvement and HAP staff both for the development and real estate operation departments. We've actively participated in the Enhanced Safety Pilot Program in North Portland with Havala and engage with John Campbell trainings. Um, an important aspect of developing and operating affordable, low-income and special needs housing is meeting the needs of the larger community without sacrificing the needs of the resident population being housed. Uh, the principles of SEPTED, as envisioned in this resolution, seek to balance SEPTED principles with livability and attendant operational and budget challenges. Um, the resolution provides a framework for developing an implementation plan and administrative procedures that happily will be fair and equitable. Um, so, and then just you had brought up a point about um, existing properties or having the housing authority take buy or take over a property that had issues. I think, um, I think I speak correctly that we would be happy to um, remodel, or revamp, or put the money into things to make it safer. Um, that's the way our director has has run and would continue to to do. So. Um, we commonly take over projects that need quite a bit of work, but I think um, we're happy to invest in things that make it, um, better livability for our residents. That's all. Is that it? That's all signed up. Okay. Further discussion? Please call the vote. Adams? Well, I want to thank you for a great presentation. appreciate the discussion and the dialogue. I think there's... Uh, a real opportunity here, and um, you have my commitment to uh, keep at it. I uh, want to thank the mayor for his work. That seminar you went to 30 years ago has really paid <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think this is great. I think uh, making the community safer at every opportunity we can, you know, reduce the calls for service is exactly what we should be doing. So thank you for your leadership. Uh, happy Thanksgiving. Aye. Fish. I just want to uh, warn my colleagues that uh, Kate Allen helped me write some brief yeah. remarks. So if you want to call in for dinner, <laughs> we, we, we can adjourn, we we can adjourn now and come back, pages. Mayor. But get um, more of those sandwiches. Really, first, really? Is this a filibuster? <laughs> what is this? So let me begin, um, if I could, Mayor, by thanking you. Uh, who You have offered our city consistent leadership on quality of life and safety issues affecting residents regardless of income. And to Jeremy on your staff, for his good work, to Stephen Fulton at BHCD, to Stephanie Reynolds, John Campbell, and to Maria Rubio, also known as Carmen's mom. Uh, <laughs> I also want to thank our friends at the Housing Authority of Portland and the Oregon Opportunity Network, who provided invaluable uh, affordable housing community perspective on these issues. Um, and I want to recognize that staff at ONI and the mayor's office worked diligently and collaboratively with the affordable housing industry to address their concerns, which I think is reflected in the fact that a representative of OON was here today to, to endorse uh, this, uh, this work. Our city has consistently led by example on housing issues, uh, and recently our focus has broadened to af from affordability to housing safety issues. Um, the mayor and this council strongly believe that every city resident should feel safe and secure at home whether the home is an architect design modern home in Council Crest or an apartment in a multifamily development in Lentz. Last week, the Quality Rental Housing Work Group brought forward a set of recommendations reflecting a consensus of both industry and tenant represent representatives to kick, uh, to kick up our complaint initiated process uh, several notches when there are repeated issues with basic housing health and safety matters such as mold or exposed electrical wiring. Safety by design is another set of tools to address the safety and well-being of our residents. Our nonprofit community partners have been admittedly ahead of the curve on many of the SEPTEB recommendations, 
such as voluntarily installing lightings in the projects they develop to give all tenants a feeling of safety on the premises. By implementing basic safety by design principles in the development of every other affordable housing project, the city and its community partners can continue to play a national leadership role in the development and management of multifamily housing. Now, as with any other, any set of recommendations as complex as these, the devil lives in the details. Uh, and I want to thank the mayor and staff for the commitments they've made uh, in terms of the next phase, which is working out the, uh, the rules and the regulations and the opportunity to have that come back before council uh, for us to review. We're in tough economic times, and there are probably tougher economic times ahead. We in government must take care to balance what we ask of our community partners with the level of support we're prepared to give them. We appreciate that the housing, uh, affordable housing industry is willing to embrace SEPTEB design elements, and I think it's incumbent on the council to work in good faith to ensure that they can live with the final policies and procedures as applied. Now, the administrative policy and procedure development will be led by ONI because of its special expertise, but I'm pleased that we'll include full participation by BHCD, PDC, and BDS. In my judgment, the final policies and procedures must be clear, non-intrusive, and cost-effective. And they must not impose new layers of compliance and reporting significantly above and beyond what is currently required. In light of our severe shortage of affordable housing, the final policies and procedures must not inhibit the development process, nor is that the intent. And the resolution, I think, correctly includes a waiver provision that may be employed to make sure that is not the case. The final policies and procedures should include provision for an evaluation of SEPTEP as it is applied after we have uh, a year of experience under our belt. And we should look to see if we have achieved the goals that SEPTEP laid out. Long-term savings of city resources through easier property management, reduced calls for service, and increased safety and livability for property residents and visitors. This is the goal of SEPTEB, and the evaluation would be an ideal time to address any ambiguities or implementation issues that may have arisen. Again, I'd like to thank all those who have worked diligently on these recommendations, and I'm pleased to vote aye. Saltzman. Well, I want to thank this uh, the group for coming up with this recommendations. It reminds me a lot of our city green building policy, which also uh, applies only to city-owned facilities or, or, in the case of PDC, city finance facilities. Although we've you know, we do have discussions ongoing about how do we you know do we take this further. Uh, so anyway, I'm struck by the analogy, but I, I think this is a good place to start. And uh, it sounds like SEPTED is a is a proven proven item in increasing people's uh, public safety and their, their perception of safety. And so we look forward to seeing how this unfolds in the next six months and, and come back to us with some rules that uh, will work for everybody. Uh, but I think this is a great step forward and I want to thank Mayor Potter as well. And uh, I know Mayor Potter has a, a turkey to spare at four o'clock, so I don't want to talk too much longer. <laughs> but it's stay of yeah, stay of execution first. <laughs> That's amazing. So, anyway, this I'm pleased to vote on it. Well, I want to thank the committee, too, because um, it really has been a labor of love. You folks, uh, I know, started out much larger, and we've narrowed down. But I think that by testing it out at this, this size, we can learn a lot from it and learn how to apply it, as Commissioner Adams said, to some of those problem areas that not only are repeat calls for the police, but all for... Um, greater security for our, our community. And so uh, I, I think this is a great first step. And um, I will be sitting uh, in my armchair watching Channel 30 to see what the next step will be. <laughs> and uh, I really do um, look forward to this. Uh, it, it has been a long time coming, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of that work. And John Campbell, um, although you're a hired gun, uh, we really appreciate your work because I know having known you for 20-some years, that uh, you do it because you believe in it. And in this particular case, um, we've had a lot of uh, good discussions. Um, some may say arguments, but they're discussions. And I think that it's been a good product. And uh, finally, I want to wish everybody uh, 
um, a happy Thanksgiving. And tomorrow, when you're sitting with your respective families or friends, think about those who aren't as fortunate. And over the coming months, we're going to have more of those folks in our community. We have 117,000 children that go to bed hungry every night. I think that uh, we need to also move to action and make sure that, um, as we are thankful, that we can provide the opportunities to others to be thankful as well. So thank you folks for being here. Enjoy Thanksgiving, and I really appreciate the good work. I vote aye. We're adjourned. Do we have a Thursday council? No. Okay, we're adjourned until next week. That's Thanksgiving. That is, that is Thanksgiving. We get tomorrow off, I think.